Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, how stealthy do you feel right now? Oh, no one can see me but myself, so very. Oh, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> I can't see you. Yeah. <laughs> the The internet is, like, stealth for everyone. <laughs> the only one that can see me is my personal FBI agent. Okay, well, say say hi to Doug for me. Anyway, so I was thinking about this recently, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, is the uh, is the concept of stealth in gaming? Because uh, usually, when you go into an RPG, the first thing that occurs to you is uh, I smack things with a sword. And a lot of times, when I'm playing games, it feels like the game kind of really wants me to just smack things with a sword. But then they give you all of these other options for stuff you can do. And one of them that I always feel kind of gets left on the cutting room floor, it's ne- not fleshed out quite as well, is stealth mechanics. Going up and, and sneaking really softly behind somebody and then uh, stabbing them with a sword. So <laughs> stab, them, stab them softly and quietly. St- stabbing them softly with your song. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. I was actually thinking about this recently when I was like playing Skyrim and realizing that stealth mechanics don't feel nearly as satisfying <laughs> in some other games. Is the idea that uh, stealth can occasionally feel like it's a little bit underdeveloped and also that, you know, even if you're playing in a stealth way, it feels so much more economical to just run up to somebody and hit them with a sword. Have you found that in games? Sometimes. I mean, there there are times when there are enough enemies around that just kind of waltzing in and stabbing the place to death isn't really viable. Okay. Uh, mostly, like, in video games, typically, that you'll see that kind of thing. But in tabletop, generally, there's a lot more unconstrained area where you could sneak around if you want to, so... Well, I remember when I was... Uh playing it in my one campaign and i was uh, a shadow monk so technically stealth was supposed to be a thing i do usually though stealth was utilized not in a combat uh way it was used sort of out of combat to try and avoid situations not really for actively going up and trying to attack enemies i was mostly it was mostly like okay here's a big camp full of enemies and maybe you want to avoid them so I could do things like pass without trace and try to use my, uh, you know, mask myself and my colleagues so that we could succeed on stealth checks. Yes. But, but I rarely ever used it for actual combat. Like, how can I use stealth as a viable means of combat rather than going up and doing straight melee instead? Well, I mean, stealth, you can hide in the shadows of the bow, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, sneak attacks are things. You can also get sneak attack from stealth. Uh, That's true. Occasionally, I don't know how many tabletop games actually let you do this. I know a lot of video games let you do this, but if you sneak up on someone, you can just instantly kill them. Coup de gras. You um, or, or you can do significantly higher damage. Right, either an increased critical or you get uh, the sneak attack, essentially, is what tabletop typically. There, there's a few systems where what they do is they basically do like a super critical or like a guaranteed critical. And then I've seen some systems where it's specifically sneak attack damage modifiers, like uh, as a sneak attack itself, uh, independent of being, you know, a critical, it does like 2x damage, 3x damage or whatever. Um, and, uh, and some of those get pretty high too. I've yeah, I've seen yeah. sometimes where those modifiers get. I think Skyrim, because I mentioned it just not too long ago. If you're doing it with a dagger specifically, you can go up, uh, you know, your sneak tree to the point where a dagger attack will do like 15 times damage. Yep. If you're, and then if you're wearing stuff. some of the uh, assassins uh, guild items, there's I think a pair of gloves that deals double damage from sneak attacks or backstabs. That sounds or right. That's so you can do right. up to 30 times. That's perfect. And if you've already broken the game, that's a really... <laughs> that's a really Right, and then, if you're, and then if you're, I think, an orc that gets that uh, perk, that a power that lets you double damage for a short duration, then you go up to 60 times. Yeah, so there you go. And anything that fun. doesn't die is 60 times damage dealt, honestly, yeah. is, is probably just that one guy. 
and you get the you get the potions going, and then you could raise that even higher <laughs> for your, for your, like your one handed damage. But I think the thing that made me feel like uh, stealth is not re- really like the recommended way, if there is such a thing, a recommended way to play gaming, is because in order to pull off stealth attacks, even if they're uh, you know higher damage and everything. It does take a lot longer to do setup and execution for a stealth build. I kind of feel well, like that's yeah. the part and parcel, right? Like, Well, especially in like tabletop, it's the, well, typically to do a stealth thing, you need to make the skill checks. Right. So you, first of all, ins- instead of just walking in and swinging a sword, just, uh, you know, the only things you have to do is, is attack rolls, uh, you yeah. have to set up the stealth. You have to either... Uh, if it's like three five, you had to do move silently and sneak, or hide. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to approach. You know, you have to go a roundabout way to approach the enemies if you want to do that, mm-hmm. uh, because you can't generally make a beeline straight for someone because you get in their line of sight and they're probably going to see you. In in a lot of cases, they'll see you. In some cases, they won't. You know, maybe they're blind. Maybe you have an item that makes you invisible. You know. But if you have an item that makes you invisible, then again, then you're just walking up and stabbing them. But but the whole concept of the stealth thing there is that instead of just going, oh, I'm gonna walk up and stab this guy with my sword, it's the you it's it's you have to be skilled. Mm-hmm. And yes, swinging a sword technically is something you need to be skilled at in yeah. theory. Uh, in games, you don't really there's not a whole lot in tabletop games for skill levels of that. Uh, mm. Typically, it's just your attack bonus. Um, but this means you have to kind of be like, all right, well, it's opposed roles. You have to beat what they get, or their their perception bonus, or their perception roll, depending if it's passive or if they're actively looking out for you. Um, mm. You have to beat that with your own roll. And if you fail that, then suddenly your entire setup was wasted because they see you or they hear you. Right. That kind of uh, brings up a subject that I've always felt was one of the the most broken parts, though, of stealth gaming, which is uh, stealth seems to work for a while, but the second it doesn't, you're back into basically just smacking things with a sword as fast as you possibly can. Right, and on the flip side there, and I know, like, 5e, they kind of made it a little easier on you. I don't know for a lot of other games Mm -hmm. uh, what they do, but it, it doesn't have to be you have to have in stealth, and it doesn't have to be a backstab. Um, a sneak attack is whenever they're denied their dexterity bonus, I believe. Mm. Uh, whenever they're caught, they're flanked or flat-footed, as it were. Oh, okay. So, like, if you have someone on one side of them and you're on the other side of them, uh, I believe it still counts as you getting a sneak attack because they're flanked. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I um, I realized, too, the uh, other thing that I see in I see it in video games, but I don't think it's really implementable in tabletop games is the idea of actually getting back into stealth after you've pretty much broken stealth. If you can give me an example from, like, a a role-playing game where they're able to do this, I haven't seen it myself, but just the idea of, like, okay, well, I was in stealth, and then, okay, now I'm in active combat, but uh, I'd like to get back into stealth somehow. I don't usually see rules for that to try and... and, In in tabletop, you mean? In tabletop gaming, yeah. I I don't think I've seen specifically that. I know, like, for instance, playing uh, World of Warcraft, I mentioned a bit ago, I've been playing Rogue again, um, because I've been trying to work on that. One ability you have is Vanish, Mm -hmm. which basically you just up in a puff of smoke. Right. So I, I would assume that you could design something, if it doesn't already exist, where you get items like smoke bombs, for instance. Yeah. Uh, or potions of invisibility can break that as well. Um, yeah. But there's a big difference as well between a video game where you say chug a potion of invisibility mid combat and then go invisible or put the, put the one ring of power on and suddenly you're invisible <laughs> and out of combat. The difference between like a video game and a tabletop game there is that once you have gone invisible again with Vanish and World of Warcraft, for instance, you lose pretty much all aggro except for certain situations. And all the monsters that were around you lose their aggro and run back to wherever they were patrolling. Right. Because right. there's no other targets to engage. They're no longer in combat, so they go back to their AI routines. Right, right. Uh, 
Tabletop games, on the other hand, that's not a thing. No. You don't vanish from sight and suddenly the NPCs that your DM is controlling, they don't suddenly have amnesia about the last <laughs> three minutes of combat. <laughs> they look for you. Yeah, yeah. I know, that was always the most realistic thing about video games, is like, oh yeah, no, we had an intruder in the facility, just killed, like, three of my friends. Um, oh well, problem, problem solved, can't see him now. Back to patrol. Uh, yeah, in a tabletop game, that doesn't really work. Uh, but I could imagine that in a tabletop game, at least you could do something like break line of sight. Right, and like you, you could go around corners, you can hide behind pillars. Right. I mean... If you're hiding behind a pillar, someone might see you and come after you. Or if you are in a corner, then you can duck into a hallway. There are lots of ways you can me mess with that. Right. I could see how that might help. They're still alerted to the fact that you're there, but that you might still be able to get a sneak attack on them if, you, if they're not aware of you when you, like, duck around the corner, come back at them from behind. This actually makes me think of something entirely off this subject, but still in this subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it's not stealth, but, like, tabletop war games, like, uh, Warhammer, for instance. Yeah. Imagine if you could find a way where, you know, as a player, you can see the whole battlefield and where all the units are. Mm -hmm. But imagine if there was a way that you could shroud the table so that if you are on one side, you have line of sight to everything in front of you. But, like, from, I guess you could do it if you kind of restricted your view down to table level but like if their light source only made it so you can only see like what your troops can see that would be cool something that like that cool. yeah um but that would be hard because then you'd have to do it from the ground general's point of view in that instance right uh, whereas instead you could just be like yeah no i'm getting if you want to role play that you'd be like yeah no i'm getting this uplink from the satellite or our fleet in orbit that's showing me where things are but right. it, it's similar where there's that line of sight break Right, right. You'd almost have to have almost a battleship kind of set up. You, know, you can see your troops, they can see their troops, but until you actually hit, you wouldn't really know where they were. Or, if you had, like, invisible units, you could just not have them on the board. Like, maybe your you'd opponent You'd still have to find a way to, them. in that case, you'd have to find a way to put where they are. Um, uh, hence battleship the, you'd the... have to have like you'd have to have like the grid to actually uh you know show where they were but you could only you be the only person that could actually see it until until they actually could reveal where you are at which point right. you'd have to get revealed on the actual main war map so you you could do something like that i'm sure that it's it's much easier in a video game setting than it would be in a tabletop standing because the analog pieces and everything that you need to set up You'd have to have, like, a technology where you had pieces that were only visible by one of the people playing <laughs> um, and not the other ones until you had, like, goggles on where you could actually see it. You'd have to have, oh, you'd have to have wargaming in VR. You'd have to have, like, the people that are playing in, like, an augmented reality with, like, the goggles on. So that they could yeah. actually see Yeah, them. you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to play a four-hour game of Warhammer and VR. With, with, with goggles on? <laughs> like, I know? pick up this thing. Oh, no, the VR control. I dropped it. Oh, they went everywhere. And they glitched all the way across the world. Can you imagine playing Wargaming, but it's just that, uh, it's just that Surgeon Simulator game? <laughs> just trying to pick stuff up and throw it across the board. <laughs> Okay, I got my chaos I mean, orc and just, yes. just gonna throw it at the. Oh no, it landed in the volcano. That would that wouldn't work very well. See, I can imagine that something like VR, like when that technology starts to really take off, and maybe when it's more like an augmented reality system, so that you can use it in the real world. I I can see how that might help a little bit with different kind of tabletop applications when we're talking about stealth, not just for your characters, but also for enemy characters. Uh, like when you have uh, stealthed or shadowed uh, enemies that are coming at you and trying to figure out how you reveal them and keep them from doing stealth attacks on you as well, um, it, it would be a little bit helpful for that. But it like out of the gate, without any technology in your hands except a pen and paper, I, I still don't see how you can really make stealth as viable as it is in like a video game. 
that seems to be a big problem. Also, there's not a lot of, when it comes to, like, skills, abilities, weapons, all of that, it does feel like stealth often gets a, the short end of the stick for a lot of that. Like, you know, you have a, a lot of different skills in, like, a D&D, &D, uh, if you are trying to persuade people, or if you're trying to do athletics checks, or you're trying to do strength, you know, checks. What, what do you really have for stealth? You, you roll for the stealth. And, uh, you can do athletics and stealth, too. How would you uh, implement that? Running while you're stealthed, for instance. Or, like, I can... wall jumping. Oh, Doing okay. any ac activity athletically while mm -hmm. staying hidden. What if I want to ninja run all the way over there? What if I don't want to sneak slowly? What if I want to fucking run? That's what I'd want you to know, do. Run running creates a lot more no noise, so a good stealth check in that sense would mean you're running. And right. you're stepping in places that are not mm -hmm. generate a lot of sound. Yeah. The thing about that is, is that uh, maybe this is just a, a preconception people have about stealth in general, is the idea that stealth is very slow by comparison to other forms of uh, combat. If I'm using magic or if I'm using uh, swords or whatever, or bow, uh, is that stealth can be, because you need to have so much set up and you have to, you know, figure out enemy positions and all of that, that it's just slow by comparison. But I take a uh, cue from another video game series, which isn't usually implemented in tabletop, which I feel is a, a real missed opportunity. I don't think you've ever played Splinter Cell. Uh, it's been a very long time. Been a very long time. Okay. Well, you might remember, like, in the early Splinter Cell games, that it was fairly slow combat. Like, it was very methodical. I hide in the shadows. I learn the enemy routes. I, I sneak up behind people. Uh, or I, you know, do my, my wonderful scissor, you know, GCVD uh, split <laughs> and then just drop down on people. In the first few games, it's like that. But when you get to, I want to say it was Conviction, uh, where Sam Fisher was sort of on the run and um, had to kind of like get down in dirt. He didn't have like third echelon tech with him. He had, in order to like look under doors and stuff, he had to have like a broken... A side mirror from a, a car that he stuck onto a stick so that he could, he was he was rogue at that point but they focused a lot more on fast stealth in that you know trying to get through a level very quickly and efficiently while not being detected and taking out guards before they noticed you and once they implemented that kind of thing, I was like, oh, okay, so stealth doesn't have to be slow. It can just be a tactical version of of an actual combat scenario. How do right. I quickly get, like, okay, this guy's moving over there. I got to do this before, you know, this, this guy goes around here. Boom, behind him. Pull out my gun. Uh, shoot that other guy. And then uh, y your neck goes away. And then I, get, I duck behind something. Mark and execute these two. And, uh, and then try I mean, to run for the exit. I mean, exit. you pulled out the gun, you suddenly are no longer in stealth. Well, it's a silent pistol, though. And we I all mean, know that that never alerts anybody. <laughs> we all know that silenced guns in video games emit no noise. They do the... Opposed to oh, suppressed weapons, IRL, which, which still make noise. They, they do, they do. They generate a lot of noise, still. Yes. Just a lot less noise. Uh, than it would have right if you know the physics behind that it's because there are multiple parts of a gun that actually do make noise so you're only suppressing one of them and, and even then it's it's not gonna silence it it's going to baffle it and um it might hide like your flash or something that's but... that's a whole thing there is a wonderful video i think smarter every day did it Mm -hmm. uh, where he's got someone, he got someone to make an acrylic suppressor. Oh, wow. So you can see exactly what goes on from the barrel of the gun with the suppressor on it and what happens to make that suppressed. Oh, wow. It is fascinating. Uh, I think they break it because acrylic, they it's can only get a couple long. shots. The yeah. guy made like two, I think. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, this, it's not going to last that long because acrylic uh as opposed to that it cracked it broke or whatever but it was still super fascinating because i got it in slow-mo oh yeah yeah so if, if like you're listening and you have not seen that um i believe it's smarter every day destin is awesome yeah i think i i had seen a video too where they were testing out 
the classic that you see in a lot of video games and in movies and stuff, which is, uh, oh, I could use the bottle. Remember, like, I can use the plastic bottle as a silencer on the end of the Yeah, thing. yeah, that, I mean, uh, it kind Kinda? Of... <laughs> but, it, but not really, because, one, you'd have to use a very large one in order to do any kind of sound suppression, and it only works the once. You really have to wrap that well. You have to do a lot of insulation work and everything, and and, and it blows out immediately after the first use anyway. <laughs> so... Speaking of YouTubers, Game Maker's Toolkit also did something about stealth mechanics that had that type of thing as well. Uh, they did a um, they did a mini series, I believe, a few parts. Yeah, there, there was one that I think he talked about. Yeah, stealth bottles. You know, it it will break immersion, but it's still fun. So you know, right? Whatever. Well, when when you're talking about in video games, um, the there there's a lot of things that break immersion. Like you were talking about returning to patrol routes because everything's fine. I mean, the entire idea of having heads-up display. Yep. A UI, that's totally me. But that's not today's subject anyways, and tabletop games don't have uh, UIs typically. No, but you know, what if they did? If you had the gm system that, that allowed for it. I feel like that's more a board game than anything else if they tried that. Um... So what you're really saying is we need VR uh, RPGs with UIs as, like, video game hotbars? I need all of those letters put together. <laughs> I, need, I need a VR UI RPG FPS OMG. I think, actually, honestly, that'd be really neat if we got it, like... I know there's games like Sword and Sorcery and stuff on the VR. Mm -hmm. But imagine if someone made, like, a D&D &D variant... Where you can play it in VR, you get your character models, and you can up you can have maps, and you can do the party. So you could do a whole campaign to play with other players, and have a GM built in, for instance, and it prompts you options mm. uh, in the game that you can pick and do. So you're just kind of playing it. It's like Skyrim, yeah. But v you know, it's like VR Skyrim, except it's a complete like D and D experience, where instead of like, oh yeah. I don't know what my abilities are. You can, like, go into your screen like Skyrim, check your abilities and see what you want to use and do that. You make the rolls for it. Hmm. That'd be really interesting. It reminds me of something that I played. You're, you're familiar with a, a thing called uh, Clue, I'm sure, as a board game. It, right. I've got a clue about it. You've got a clue about it. You, you remember the movie and the game that eventually was based on it. Um, no, no, that's, that's the wrong way that around. There was, like, a follow-up that they did to Clue. This is a deep dive, folks, and I only know because I used to play it, which was called the... The movie? It, no, no, not the movie. No, the game. Oh. The actual, the actual Clue board game, you know, it's, it's Miss Marple in the kitchen with the sweet roll or whatever. I think that was in the actual Clue game. There was a, a game that they came out with that was also essentially Clue, but it was called The Great Museum Caper. I had to look it up to remember oh. what it was called. But so it's not the night it... A museum caper? No, it is different than that. But the way, but it was actually, it played differently. It was actually an asymmetrical game, so David would love this. David, okay. if you're listening, here's an asymmetrical game for you. You'd love this. Uh, in this particular game, you had a museum set up, and there were all these valuable paintings that you could place wherever you wanted to, and some, like, cameras and stuff that you could place. And there was one player that was the thief. And the thief was not actually on the board at all. The, the thief was actually being tracked on a piece of paper by the player itself to figure out how they were going to try to get around the character's at line of sight and the cameras and everything to try and steal all the paintings and leave the museum before they get caught. Then the rest of the players are going through the museum trying to track down the thief because, like, on the turn after you've stolen a painting, the painting then vanishes from the map. So you know that like in the last turn or two, that thief was in that spot at that time. And, right. and so the idea was, uh, can all of the characters and the sentries and everything that you've set up uh, catch the thief before the thief gets away with all of the paintings and, and leaves the museum? But the only person okay. that actually knows where the thief is is the, the thief themselves until they get caught. And I thought that that was really interesting, like, when we were talking about, you know, could you do something like that with Field of View? They kind of implemented that, but it had to be in a board game setup, not really in an RPG setup. Yeah, you would have to, either, like, have tiles numbered or something like that. Mm-hmm. 
where you'd have to have some way of, like a chessboard almost. Yeah. Where it's got, you know, your cross location, uh, your cross reference for a location. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, if you ever wanted to know if people were being on the up and up, you could always look at, at their sheets at the end and see if they were moving the necessary, you know, number of spaces and everything. Because there was, like, actually, I'll throw this link in your chat so you can at least see what I'm talking about. But the idea was that, you know, the piece of paper that they have in front of you kind of dictates that they've actually done what they were supposed to be doing. Um, but yeah, Clue the Me Great Museum caper. Check it out today. I think you can still, oh my goodness. B b oh boy, I should see if I can find this because apparently they're very expensive now. That is definitely not how much it, it costs to begin with, folks. Ooh, $230. Yeah, originally it was like 30 bucks, I think. <laughs> like when it originally came out. But it's probably because there's so few versions of it left. <laughs> Only one left in stock. very small game. Hey, you can pay 38 33 a month for six months to buy it. I gotta find mine. I've, I have it somewhere. I, I assume it didn't sell very well if it's $230 and I've never heard of it. It's a very different game than Clue. Because obviously you're not trying to fight, figure out who the murderer is. You're just trying. You're trying to catch a thief in as they steal paintings. So it's a very different game. But I think that they were like, well, if we branded this new game as Clue, maybe it would sell better. And then all of the pieces we're just going to name after the characters in the Clue game. Wow. And so I'm sure that it was a branding thing. But it really is a completely different game than Clue. <laughs> But it's actually a very fun one if you ever get if you happen to have one in a closet. I would not recommend paying. $230 for, for Clue the Great Museum Caper. So that was the first real example I saw of stealth being implemented in a tabletop game, but I did find that when I got into RPGs specifically, like in tabletop RPGs, it, it is a little bit harder to, to implement. One, maybe because I don't have the board to actually represent stuff, but also because you, there is a lot of storytelling aspect and you do try to use logic more for the for the gm um stealth is very hard to pull off a lot of times uh i suppose if we were to kind of like put a put a cap on this uh stuff that's really useful like let, let's just kind of run down stuff that's kind of useful if uh if you want to make stealth a viable option in your games things you might want to consider i would say my first one would be uh, actual sneak attack or stealth damage bonuses. I mean, that's good for combat. I would I would also say that important if you want stealth to be viable, it's having non-combat stuff you can do from stealth. Mm. Like sabotaging, setting traps, perhaps. You know, things like that. Like, maybe you want to uh, follow somebody, tail them. There should be some sort of increased skill for tracking someone if you're stealth, if you're a stealth tracker. That might actually, that's a very good point, though, because stealth, we always think of it in terms of, like, at least I usually think of it in terms of, like, how is this viable for combat, but actually stealth has the really neat mechanic of being very useful to avoid combat or to mitigate combat, which other kinds of class builds wouldn't really have. Aside from just avoiding combat itself. Right, um, right. Because there's there's other scenarios you can use it for, and most of them are going to end up being role playing, I'm sure. But I think having it so that you get a bonus to some actions outside of combat, as yeah. well as some inside combat, it makes it more of a desirable thing. What if you are looking at uh, mitigating the idea that stealth is too slow? Do you have any ideas on the best ways to? Uh... To make stealth feel faster or sleeker, so it doesn't doesn't feel like it really is dragging on. I mean, if you wanted to make it like faster, I mean, what something you could do in that case is you could say, moving at your normal speed in stealth, you get a like a normal roll, for instance. Yeah. And then if you say wanted to, it, like this is for D and D five e specifically. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you want to like stealth move, but you want to double move, or you want to move. Uh, like a run or a sprint or whatever like that, maybe you make a stealth roll at disadvantage. No, and if okay. you want to kind of take your time with it, maybe you want to move it with advantage. Mm -hmm. That could be something as well, because then you go, all right, normal speed, you're a straight roll in your d20. You want to take your time, slowly do it, 
like if you're tracking someone and they're moving slowly, you, you want to keep your distance. Mm-hmm. Then you can do like, ah, I'll take advantage and I'll do it slowly to make sure I'm really not getting seen. Mm-hmm. But if you want to like double move and like rush into combat, but do it with stealth, they'll like, yeah, take that at disadvantage, but you can move like twice the distance and you can attack them when you get there. I think that right. would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, something else I've seen in D and D specifically, uh, I'm sure it's implemented in other systems now, is the idea of actual like backstab damage, like which you can even use if you're in main combat if your enemy is like flanked. Uh, so if uh, another character is attacking a target and you are a, like a second attacker, you can usually use backstab modifiers. So that's actually fairly fast. It's combat centric, but it is specific to really the rogue class, which is a stealth build by nature. So, uh, so, th- so that is actually pretty fast, even in combat itself. Something yeah. to consider. Um, good. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, uh, stealth is actually a lot of fun when it's implemented properly, but a lot of times it feels like it's kind of like a system people have to put in because people want it to be an option and it doesn't always get fleshed out as much as as the basic melee and ranged combat options. At, at least that's been my experience. I don't know if you felt the same way, but... No, it definitely comes across that way in, in a lot of different games. Yeah. It it really the only times I've seen it implemented really effectively is in games that are specifically stealth based. Like when when you get into games that actually are focused specifically on stealth, it usually does a pretty good job. But when it is one option among many, it usually gets kind of the short end of the stick because because the other options are so efficient. I, I like stealth games in video games. I like stealth action games because I think that they're a lot of fun and it's it's neat to be able to kind of try to go around maps and, uh, you know, be undetected as you're, you know, stealthily taking people out and be Batman or Sam Fisher in, in that regard. And I just kind of wanted to see more of it in terms of, of tabletop gaming. Uh, but I, I haven't been able to even with stealthy characters yet. Maybe this will help out in case you're looking to put stealth mechanics into your game or feel like you're obligated to because people kind of do expect it. But you know what? I, I'm actually going to say it. You don't have to be obligated to put it in if you don't want to. I'm just saying it right now. I'm making my stand, Alex. Okay, make your stand. My stand, stand is... Stand on that soapbox. <laughs> I'm going to die on this hill. You don't have... You're going to get backstabbed on this hill. I'm going to get backstabbed on this hill. Thus, thus proving me wrong hey if you can pull it off and not be in my line of sight which we threw in at the end good times alex nathan if the folks out there were interested in being a little stealthy online to discover or steal all of the delve content that we've created then they should go ahead and subscribe to express vpn <laughs> Our sponsor for the Not a sponsor. Raycon. (laughs) The earbuds I'm using right now. Ray. Make sure you go to nordvpn.com backslash. (laughs) Not a sponsor. And hey, I wanted to let everybody know that I'm really enjoying Keeps. I finally have two hairs on my head. People are going to love that. Also, Raid Shadow. (laughs) Hashtag not a sponsor. Hashtag not sponsored by literally anyone. But um, where where could they go? <laughs> I bet you weren't expecting that. No, I think my reaction pretty <laughs> much told you that much. Yep. Keep it in the episode. Yep. <laughs> That's fine. I don't care. But if you'd like to see more of Delve, uh, and what we do over here in our corner of the not sponsored internet, uh, you can go to delvecast dot com. You certainly can. And uh, in addition to seeing Delve. Uh, I do occasionally make some videos, and we do occasionally uh, write some written stuff if you like reading. And I have another little podcast that I've been doing recently that I'm uh, rather enjoying called Citanium Mine, which is uh, specifically about individual games. Uh, So you can find that all over there. And if you want to get some of this stuff uh, early and you want to get extended episodes and some stuff that we don't even really put on the site itself, uh, you can go over to our Patreon and check that out. Uh, by becoming just a very basic level patron. 
you can actually get access to all of that content. So that's really great. And if you happen to be a Shining Level patron, I get to say your name at the end of these episodes. For instance, Bonnie Ainsworth and Nick, who help us keep the digital lights on. They're very shiny. That's why they're Shining Level patrons, by the way. And don't forget Drunk Paul, who is also a Shiny Level member uh, on our Discord. Yes, he helps keep our Discord lights on. We very much appreciate that. He helps keep the bandwidth up. He keeps the bandwidth (laughs) up, and especially for these recording sessions, that is critical. So we do appreciate that. Uh, Also, you can find us on the uh, social medias. I believe that's what they're called now. The the socials. Specifically, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. So if you uh, go over there, uh, we do tweet occasionally, uh, but you also uh, any notifications about new content that comes to the site, it, it all goes through uh, Delve Podcast. So you can uh, you can follow there if you want to get up to the minute, up to the minute, up to the Notifi- minute. Uh, for all the minutes that I'm not on social media. But Delve, Delve is always on social media, whether you understand it or not. And if you want to talk to us, well, almost live, I mean, we've got a Discord. We've got a link to it, too. We do have a Discord link and become part of the conversation, and uh, then we can talk game design together. And if you're interested in, in game design at all, we do always like to talk to uh, new and uh, upcoming uh, game devs that are working on stuff independently. We have several that are part of our community already uh, that we'd like to talk to and uh, communicate with and, and, and have in the forums. So it's always good to kind of have people that are, you know, either in tabletop gaming, like to build stuff themselves, or uh, are developing systems all of their own. And we're uh, lucky to have a pretty good crew that do indeed uh, do stuff like that. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. See you later. What's your favorite stealth character that you'd want to actually be in real life? Like a specific character? Yeah, like a specific character. Like a one person? G- yeah, unless you have an example of like a, a, like a, a bag full of bees that are very stealthy. I don't know. No, I mean, I would just, I would want to be like, it's either I'd want to be Solid Snake because I can hide under cardboard boxes anywhere. Oh. Or I'd want to be like Ezio so I can just dive into hay bales. Oh, yeah, I would definitely, yeah, Ezio would be good. Ezio would be Of course, then you miss and you land on a fork, a pitchfork, and you're just dead. You definitely would uh, end up dead in most of those scenarios. Yeah, also, a very unrealistic thing about gaming is uh, you you can't just dive from the top of, of, like, a a cathedral into a hay bale and expect to be fine. Oh, you can. But, but you only do it the bell. once. <laughs> you only do it the once, and someone's going to see it, because that hay, hay bale going to explode. Yeah, hay bale, it's not stealthy. <laughs> it's not a stealthy move. But, if, you know, if you played games specifically for the realism, you're going to be very disappointed. 